Welcome to the Creative Homeschool Podcast. In this podcast, I'm coming at you to deliver you a weekly dash of creativity to make your homeschool exciting for your kids, but for you too. We're going to explore all of the different ways to creatively homeschool. Games, field trips, unit studies, writing activities, kid businesses, art, and more. I'm your host, Julie Soule, longtime homeschool mom, shenanigan enthusiast, espresso drinker, and founder and co-owner of Soul Spark Let's Art. I've helped thousands add creativity and joy to their homeschool, and I'm ready to help you too. Ready to get started? Let's go. Welcome to the Creative Homeschool Podcast. Today, I have an incredible guest for you. Her name is Erica Rasiglioni. And she started off as a PTA mom of three kids in the public school system during the pandemic, switched to virtual learning, and then decided to homeschool and hasn't gone back. As a, I didn't expect to find myself homeschooling mom, she spent the last couple of years making a huge transition that so many parents think about, so much so that she's turned her expertise into a new podcast called So You Think You Want to Homeschool, designed to help parents when they too are suddenly homeschooling. So welcome, Erica. It's so amazing to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Miss Julie. I'm so happy to be here. You have no idea. What an excellent intro. (laughs) Well, you call yourself an eclectic homeschooler. So I was wondering if you could explain what that means for those who aren't familiar with the term and maybe what it means to you. I do. I do refer to myself as eclectic. So Eclectic homeschooling from, you know, my level of expertise really just means that we use a little bit of everything. I know that there are a lot of different curriculum options and online options and things like that. We treat our homeschool curriculum like a buffet and just take what we like, what we enjoy, what interests us. It did take me a little while to get there. When we first started out, I felt like I was a little more strict with trying to stick to things and stick to timelines. But now, I also say that we have a bit of an unschooly vibe. We still use curriculum. It's more of a tool. I use it as our tool. I'm not a slave to the curriculum. It's my resource. And uh, that's it. That's what we do. We use an online math. We use an online art (laughs) program. I wonder um, what that is. (laughs) I wonder what that could be. And we use a couple of different literature programs, a couple of different curriculums, different histories. We've done both of Curiosity Chronicles and, and History Quests. You know, I just take little bits of what works for us at that time and we kind of uh, sew it together <laughs> into a beautiful quilt of homeschool. So it's changed over the last two years then. You mean you didn't just decide on something and just keep it that <laughs> way forever and ever? Oh my goodness. Shocking as that might be. Yes, we have evolved quite a bit since our first day of homeschooling. (laughs) I feel like that initial stage of finding that curriculum where it tells you every single day what to do and how to do it is something that almost all homeschoolers that I know go through at some point. And then you, you find your way and then your way changes again, doesn't it? Oh my goodness. And I expect it will continue to change. I equate it to having a baby. Remember when you had your babies in the early stages and every time you thought you had a routine, something, there was a (laughs) sleep regression or, you know, a food that didn't work or, you know, every time you think you know what's going on, something changes. (laughs) Or they skip over a whole size and you suddenly have clothes. That's correct. Yes, exactly (laughs) like that. So yes, it's continuously changing and evolving, but that's the beauty of it. That's what I love about what we're doing. I like the term buffet too. I haven't heard that in a while. I forgot about that term because that's exactly what I used to say. And that still is how I homeschool also. Yes. And Finding the sides, the sides that complement the, the meat and potatoes. And I think the term buffet is interesting also because it doesn't just mean that you're choosing a little bit from a lot of different curriculums. It means that when you come back, you might be choosing more of something one day more of something else the next. Definitely. Depending on your homeschool hunger. Yes. What you're hungry to eat that day. Oh, I love that. It's so true. It does depend on your homeschool hunger, what you're craving. So when you left and you decided to homeschool, Mm -hmm. the term that so many use is (laughs) de-schooling. The process of kind of change the process of transitioning from 
public school to being a homeschooler. So did you de-school? And if you did, what did that look like? So yes, we did. We definitely did de-school. I actually do an episode about this on my podcast because it took me a while to learn the difference between unschooling and de-schooling. These two different things that sound the same, you know, when you're first thrown into this homeschool universe. But we did de-school. When we first started out, it was, we were COVID homeschoolers, pandemic homeschoolers, and we had started with virtual learning somewhere around, I I don't, it was not very long. It was only a few weeks. And I just closed the Chromebooks. (laughs) I was like, this is not working. And I didn't even think about homeschooling until the following year. So we had the whole remainder of that year. And then the summer where I just I decided over the summer we were going to homeschool, but I really started diving into researching and what it should look like. And this term de-schooling, I think it's so much more important for the parents almost than the kids. Because when you come from public school and you have these set in your ways, these standards and these routines and things like that, it really takes a lot to undo that. And I just think the most beautiful homeschools do not reflect public school. They're not doing school at home. And everybody has their own style. So I'm not knocking. But for us, it's just, I didn't want to be public school. I wanted to be outside. I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to be finding beautiful literature and not stressing my kids out and just enjoying it. I wanted to enjoy it. So that was really important to me. Very important. The energy of my home is like a huge focus because if you screw up the energy, you're screwing up the whole thing. (laughs) You know, as you're talking, I wonder if so many homeschoolers, when they don't have the public school experience, so they homeschool from the beginning, like I did, you tend to really revert back to what you know. And that's the public school mindset. And that homeschool is supposed to look like we're going to do math from 830 to 9. We're going Mm -hmm. to do writing from 9 to 945. And suddenly it's 930 and your kids are just coming down the stairs and they want breakfast. And then 10 minutes later, they want second breakfast because they're (laughs) hobbits. They are hobbits. It's so true. And, I, and I'm starting to wonder as we're talking, if there isn't a little bit of de-schooling where there's that huge transition where you suddenly realize, even if you're homeschooling from the beginning, that, whoa, wait a second, this isn't how it's going to work <laughs> at right. all. <laughs> right. So I will say that Even though we wound up turning that corner during the pandemic, I actually had homeschool on my radar beforehand because Mm -hmm. my son was struggling in school and he has his alphabet soup of diagnoses and he's the square peg that doesn't fit in the round hole. So I already had been putting a little bit of research into it and I just knew he was going to be a challenge for me and he had school trauma. That needed to be undone. So I knew it couldn't look like school for Mm. us. It wouldn't work that way because he had refusal going on. He was so just full of anxiety and feeling less than and and just thinking terrible things about himself at that point. So I knew he didn't want to learn. And part of what I consider our de-schooling process was actually that first year. And oh, Lord, my mother thought I was crazy because... He struggled with both reading and writing, and I didn't make him do either of those things the entire first year, even though we were following a curriculum, even though I was doing things more rigidly, I guess. I scribed for him the entire first year, even his math. I just wrote everything down for him. I read every single thing aloud to him. And that was our kind of form of de-schooling, just saying like, I wanted him to build up his relationship with learning again before we could even dive into working on those things that his confidence was so low in. And it worked. (laughs) It worked. I love that. The approach of it's okay to be you. You're safe here. Yes. You can do this however you need to learn, which I think is one of the most beautiful things about homeschooling is the ability to tailor it like that. Oh, me too. I absolutely love it. Even my daughter, it was interesting because my daughter was always a straight A student. And, you know, she just was the people pleaser and it's never a single red flag in school. But 
when we had her one-on-one, all of a sudden I noticed that there was a lot in math that she was struggling with. She wasn't grasping the concept so much as imitating. And that was a very quick remediation, but it was interesting to me to see that even she was kind of slipping through some cracks a little bit. So that was like a pretty cool thing when we first started out that I was like, wow, this one-on-one attention, like you can't sneak nothing by mom now. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, 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 you can't. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's, it's wonderful, but at this up close, you know, front row seat that I thought, I mean, I thought I was involved before, but that's nothing <laughs> compared to being involved now. That is now the beauty of it though, isn't it? It is. It is. I do. I love it. I love it. And then my little guy, he'll be in the next room doing ABC mouse and I'm asking them science questions for fifth grade science questions. And he's yelling out the answers, getting annoyed with them that they don't know it. (laughs) I had a cousin who mentioned she did not homeschool, but she mentioned the time when the youngest finally was yelling the answers before the oldest (laughs) and how there was that fun little bit of a conflict. Yes, there's something, those youngest. Call it third child syndrome. That's what I call it. I think that can happen a lot more in homeschooling because the subjects aren't separated as as often or don't have to be, you know, it just depends on the homeschool, but you get younger kids knowing the answers to some things that maybe they wouldn't have quite yet. Definitely. Which is awesome. There's not a magic school bus episode that my little guy hasn't, you know, (laughs) hasn't (laughs) sat through. When we're doing it with the big kids science program, you know, so he definitely tags along. He was my little tag along and now he's finally doing his own things this year. It's cool. It's such a great progression. Now, do you do art with your kids? Do I do art? (laughs) How on earth do you make it fit with everything else that you do in your homeschool? This is a perennial question that we hear the I don't have time for art. So I know you do art, which for those who don't know, I know Erica does art and often. So how do you make it fit in your homeschool? So this is why I consider us to have an unschooly vibe because I make it fit as often as I can. Actually, one of the things I love about your program is that there's never been a lesson that I can't find a way to fit art into in some way, shape or form. And we don't do it five days a week, certainly not. But I love to try and work art in. I love that it just gives them that break and that freedom and that creative moment. For example, this is a a fun little story. So this week, I just learned from a Facebook post in our local page that the Children's Theater, the next town over is doing Peter Pan meets Shakespeare's The Tempest. Oh, wow. That's that's quite a... Right. That's what I said. I'm like, this should be very interesting. And it's in a week. And we actually have a collection of children's Shakespeare book. And I flipped through it and the Tempest was in there. So we did that real quick. And then today I'm like, well, let's read it. So you know what we're going to see. And then today I I looked on Glitter Bombers and we wound up doing The Ship on the Rock. Oh, yes. Okay. So I typed in ship or, you know, I just will find a key word from any of our lessons and throw it in there. And I just try to work it in at least once a week because they love it. They need the break. You know, people don't realize how hard these kids are working sometimes, even though it doesn't look like it. And if I make my kids do math, I try to balance it out. <laughs> that is how well, I use gonna, it in my we're own do homeschool a project. Too. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how we do it. Just, you know, when there's been a lot of that heavy academic thinking. Yes. It's like dessert. It's dessert. Like you would never skip dessert. You got to squeeze it in. You know, it's what makes it worth it. Oh, I love that. I love that idea. (laughs) Now, do you do it quietly or do you play music in the background when you're doing it? Well, see, now that depends because my kids love a Miss Julie video. So if we're (laughs) watching a video and they are blessed enough to be instructed by the famous Miss Julie, then I don't have music in the background. But today we did have Andy Grammer playing in the background today. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll have Alexa on in the background until it becomes an issue and they start shouting out their demands and fighting over what song. And then (laughs) I I just had a feeling you seem like a play the music in the background. Yes. Person. So goodness. It's so funny. You even say this. We just found out that my kids will do simply piano and simply guitar. And they just released a simply sing app that goes along with it. It's covered under the same fee that we already pay. So they both downloaded simply sing. 
my house is a musical. I can't even explain to you what's coming from these kids' bedrooms <laughs> at the top of their lungs with their headphones on singing all these songs because they just got this app and now they're going to be famous singers. <laughs> so listeners, we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes because oh, that yes. first for me that I know that we have listeners who are looking for whether it's music theory, music appreciation, oh, you know, learning it. how to read music, play the piano, play the guitar, sing. Oh. I appreciate you bringing that up because that's... Yeah, that's a good one. And they just added the Simply Sing fairly recently, I think. I When we first signed up for it last year, it was like an advertisement, like coming soon. So when I just discovered it, now we're we're singing in here. <laughs> we are singing. a singing household. I, I can't help making up songs to just about anything. So me too. I am definitely a singer. <laughs> I I sing sometimes instead of yelling. <laughs> you know, that's a really good form of stress relief. It is. <laughs> sing. It for is. The, for it those is. of you out there who have not tried that, when you have <laughs> those hard homeschool days. And they do happen. The singing is a really good way to reconnect you. So that's right. Go clean your room. I told you to finish. (laughs) Are you done with that math problem? Because you're driving me crazy. (laughs) So do the woodland creatures come to help you homeschool? No, I wish. I wish. Okay. I, I think I was convinced that I had friends who thought that everything as a homeschooler can be that easy and that I just open the windows and I sing and the woodland animals oh. bring the children to the... So that's not how that works in your in your house? No, if I were to open the windows, I think just the dogs from the neighborhood would start howling along, if anything. <laughs> so back to art. You okay. led an art show for other homeschoolers. So how did that get started and what did it look like? And any tips if someone's like, oh, I didn't know that was possible. How do I do Uh, that? So this is like one of our proudest moments. We just moved here less than two years ago. We moved about 600 miles from our hometown and it took me a while to find a group or a co-op and and I kept on trying and just wasn't finding the right fit but I kept on bumping into another mother with the similar you know headspace we teamed up one day we became facebook friends we teamed up we said let's just start our own thing you know we're going to make a social club we'll meet at the playground once a week blah 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 but we both came from public school backgrounds And we both miss things like the Halloween party or like we're doing a Valentine's Day party. And she brought up the idea of an art show. And we very last minute threw this thing together. We barely had even started our group. It was only a couple months into the school year, but we called the local library. I think it was $20 to rent the room for four hours, something like that. And we put it on our Facebook page, which we had just... I think at the time we probably had 50 people on this page, but you know how Facebook groups work. We really only had like five people that were actually showing up to these things. Yes, which that's exactly how that works. Which winds up being a decent amount of kids. You know, if you got five moms, we had like 12 to 15 kids every week, which was a nice group, but we were not expecting the turnout that we had. It was like all of these homeschoolers came out of the woodwork. We almost didn't have enough table space. And we just said, bring your art. We went on Pinterest and took screenshots of some art displays, whether you wanted to use an easel or a trifold poster board or however you wanted to display your art and just let us know our SVP. So we make sure we have table space, which it came close. We did set up some stuff in the back. I think some magnetiles and and little stuff for the, for the younger kids. We did it after school. We did it in the evening, you know, invite grandma and grandpa or an aunt and uncle. We were trying to replicate that public school art show. And we also said to bring a box and we left out comment cards for people to write little notes and compliment. And and just, it was so sweet. Comment cards was probably my favorite part because afterwards the kids were so excited. Their friends left them notes. People they didn't know left them notes. Just one little what detail that- Self-confidence. Oh, it That's was a great awesome. idea. We also printed out, I think we might've even grabbed them from the dollar store, like little awards. And I went around- Everybody won an award. We did a little ceremony and I tried to use a little bit of like comedy, a little bit of alliteration. You know, everybody won a unique award, whether it was like the coolest comic strip. There were people, they had dioramas and 
sculptures, Lego sculptures. One kid did a Lego sculpture that looked exactly, it was just, um, it was his face. I think it was like a project or an app where it's like you take a picture and they give you a map, but it was, it was his face, his glasses. <laughs> it looked exactly oh, wow. like him. It was so wonderful just to see the level that everybody took it to. And they were different people than the ones who, you know, were coming to the park every week. So it was great. It really was such a great night. And uh, I think we're going to actually shoot to do another one in the spring. And then the librarians came over afterwards. We thought they were going to ask us never to come back again because we're the crazy loud homeschoolers with, you know, the little brothers and sisters crawling around on the floor. And we brought food and drinks and they gave us their cards and said, Oh. Maybe we could do some programs. It was very sweet. It was that was one of our greatest uh, greatest moments as our little crew was developing. We really had a great time that night. Libraries are such a great place to oh, get going. Definitely, definitely. And we don't have a lot of activities. We're in a more rural area. I mean, I see cows so often. I barely even shout "cow" anymore when we drive by them. <laughs> that is a you know federal offense to not shout. Cow. I know. I've been trying to convince my husband that this is, you can't not. It's hard though. I'm totally going to make him listen to this one. I just can't so keep can... up. There's so many cows lately, but so they don't even often have like a ton of stuff going on, but they were eager to work with us and just do things in the, the future, which was great. So that's in the the works. <laughs> no, that that is a great idea. Our library, we had kind of an art show, not in the same vein. But we were going to be allowed to display work at the library. But that was right before the world kind of shut down. And so everything was closed. Um, Mm -hmm. But And then everything changed homeschool group-wise and so on. But I really think that libraries are such a a great place to start if you're looking for things to do. Our library helped us host a dragon-themed book party once. And they even... I don't know where they happen to have like dragon or castle stuff in their back room at the library, but they did. And they brought them all out. Oh, my God. Opportunities and everything. So that is so wonderful. You just really never know what libraries have and what they're willing to do. Yeah. So it's true. It's true. There, our librarian just recently said that we were at, I think it was like a snap circuit STEM club that they had done and she sat down with us the same thing she was like you know oh you're the we actually now have printed out business cards for our homeschool group and our facebook page so that if people are asking at the library they could find our local group so she was like fabulous idea yes because again there's just so many people that are looking for a home and we're a very relaxed laid-back group i mean we really are mostly nerf wars (laughs) We're very Nerf oriented in our crew, but we've got a really great mix. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for something, you know, a lot of people don't have money to spend. We're free. We just pick a different park every week and we post a Facebook event for it. And we just invite whoever wants to come out, bring your own snacks. And, you know, we do it like that. But yeah, so she sat down to talk to us at the Snap Circuit event. She was like, oh, you guys are the ones that left your card. And she was like, we have this... (laughs) she opened the door to their supply closet and it was shocking what they have back there. (laughs) They do. They they're holding out on all of us. Yes. They get like different donations and stuff. She's like, we had to do multiple slime events because we had so much, they got, I guess, a donation of Elmer's glue that was so big. They couldn't even fit it all at one point. (laughs) She's like, that was years ago. We're just dwindling. (laughs) I totally forgot about that because when we had the dragon party, the librarians brought out a bunch of craft supplies too and i'm like where did yes and they said that they get donations they have an event sometimes it's different and they're kind of stuck with all this and they want to do something with it and help yeah and they're looking to get people in the door they're looking to get people in the door so if you have a library and it's not like super active start something up they're usually willing to work with you that's yeah i keep quoting if you build it they will come that's what i say to my girlfriend every week totally right yeah, <laughs> you, you're totally right. Well, I want to totally transition here to neurodiversity. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so often homeschooling is kind of the go to when parents have kids who are neurodiverse, but you yes. are neurodiverse as well. Indeed. <laughs> so, what has been your biggest challenge as a neurodiverse uh, parent who's homeschooling? 
So there's a, there's a couple of things that I find particularly challenging. I think, first of all, not having a schedule, not being like forced into, I'm now completely stay at home. I used to at least work part-time five days a week. I had to be somewhere at a certain time. Now our schedule is so all over the place and it's not consistent. And that's very difficult for my neurodiverse brain. <laughs> mm. My kids don't mind it so much, but half the morning goes by and I'm like, we got to get started. How did we get sidetracked for this long? So getting sidetracked is definitely an issue for me. I think another challenge, and this is something, so my son and I both have ADHD and we both are reactive and we both are impulsive. So we can butt heads like nobody else because he has a problem controlling himself and then I have a problem not reacting to it. And that has been a very big struggle because he's not in school for six hours a day anymore. Now we're just on top of each other all the time. So we have definitely mastered just certain terms, certain things like he now can tell when I'm starting to get overwhelmed. And I'll tell him I'm getting overwhelmed right now. I'm overwhelmed right now. I need a break from talking about Transformers. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed right now. The dog is chasing the cat around. This one just spilled something, blah, blah, blah. And I tend to throw out the I'm overwhelmed right now as a stepping stone before mommy loses it. And <laughs> it's definitely as, as a us. code, just to, yeah. yeah. It's like a safe word. It's like a, you know, like this is like the yellow light. <laughs> we, have, we have a yellow light. I feel like he has started picking up on that and kind of using it on his own. So when he sometimes yells at me, if I'm saying, okay, we need to switch like from this to this or whatever, and he'll bark because he's interrupted or, you know, whatever, he's very quick to apologize and kind of explain himself because I really just wanted to finish this. And I'm like, I understand that, but maybe next time we try and say that (laughs) before we bark. So that's some of the challenges. But I do think that the freedom, it's challenging, but it's so beautiful. And it allows us to really embrace the lifestyle at the same time. We talked a little bit about lists and how I like to use my list. Yes. So I don't follow planners the same way as maybe a neurotypical (laughs) brain might. I do like a weekly dump of all the things that I want to get accomplished. If I want to do at least three or four lessons of math, if I want to do this many chapters of the book. So on the weekend, I like to dump out all the things we want to get done in the week. And then I start checking them off in whatever order they start happening. Instead of having this like rigid schedule, I kind of just check it off as it happens. And then if it doesn't happen, I can either decide, well, I guess it wasn't that important if we didn't, you know, force it or... I have the freedom to roll it over into the following week's dump (laughs) and work it in to to get it done that next week. So that is what works really well for me. We also have whiteboards. I have a giant whiteboard and I always laugh because I feel like... (laughs) I saw that. I think on one of your TikToks, you were talking about you weren't sure why there was such a love-hate relationship with... With the whiteboard. It's controversial, the whiteboard. Some people hate them and some people can't live without them. And I am a can't live without them. But I wind up writing out my to-do list for the day on our big giant whiteboard sometimes. And then I don't have room to do a math problem or a chart <laughs> or write our vocabulary words. So now I have a secondary whiteboard that is movable. So it's a medium size and we can take it outside or in the living room or whatever. I can pop it out and write down the math equation that needs explaining or draw the diagram of the nucleus in the atom or whatever has to be <laughs> explained in that moment. But, but I do, I utilize it. have it in your face then. I mean, it's, yes. a, it's right there. So you see it and that's a good reminder. It is. It's a game changer because again, we, we all have a tendency to get sidetracked in our little neurodiverse world. And it's like a great visual representation. And it's like, you know, I mean, who doesn't love to cross something off a list? (laughs) (laughs) Are you telling me that sometimes you might have written something down that you did that was not originally on the list just to cross it off? Guilty or something that I already <laughs> I am, I am also day. guilty, but it certainly feels good. You're like, oh, look at me. I accomplished more today. <laughs> I 100%, if I have already loaded the dishwashers, I will add load dishes and then cross it <laughs> off just so I can see. I, I know some of you out there are feeling that 
<laughs> you know, are raising your hand. I know it's not just us. You need to like pat yourself on the back, you know, got to get that sense of accomplishment, mamas. I think that's important for homeschoolers because I have friends who really feel, they really honestly feel like they've done nothing that day. And yes. the conversation I will have with them will be, well, my daughter woke up and made me a three-course breakfast. She you know, fed all of our animals. She read 20 minutes on quantum physics. She went and did 30 math problems. And we just did nothing today. Right. And I'm like, you probably should write some of that down. Absolutely. What do they call that? Backwards planning, I think. Yes. I think there's a term for it, it right? It is. And it's important yes. because it is. when you have those days that you really wonder, am I doing this right? Are they learning anything? Am I doing too little, too much? You can look back yes. and really give yourself that pat on the back for all of Absolutely. those things. You don't realize think- how much you're doing in a week. In a day. No, it's funny because you see it so much in the homeschool community, but it's also funny because I say it, it goes both ways. Even when we were in public school and we were doing a million clubs, it's such a natural feeling to struggle with the enoughness, right? Yes. Are we doing enough? Are we getting enough done? That word, oh God, I wish I could like just erase it off the planet. Just this enough, enough. It's like enough already. We are enough. We are enough. And we have to give ourselves that credit. And I do love the backwards planning thing because you just don't realize it. You don't realize that even just playing sleeping queens, <laughs> you know, even just yeah. playing, you know, whatever. I let's bring it back to that simply sing app. I'm realizing that my son is singing and he struggles with reading and there's words across the screen that he has it memorized, but he's also reading these words. And I'm like, all right, well, if we don't get reading done today, but he spent an hour and a half singing his heart out, enjoying himself and actually unbeknownst to him, reading the lyrics. You Isn't know, that like, beautiful? Oh. When you think about those little ways, we often see reading as the, it has to be a book. Oh, and yes. my youngest, I don't feel like she's behind, but she's definitely slower than her older sister okay. to, to mm-hmm. learn. And I think she wanted to do a, a word search today. Okay. She has no idea she's reading the words before she's right. looking for them. And I'm like, <laughs> since when can you read that word? I thought you can't read. She's just looking. Right? She has no idea. I'm like, you know what? Just keep going. Have fun. Yeah. Look yep. for the rest don't of the even, fruit. Don't even tell her. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even tell her. You just never know. And and that that learning, it comes from anywhere and everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's enough. It's so, usually enough. <laughs> now, are you able to secure services for your neurodiverse kids as a homeschooler? Have you had to? Have you wanted to? How would you make that happen? Okay. So... I will say this. I thought about this a little bit because when we were in public school, we don't currently use services now. But when I was in public school, I learned my way around an IEP meeting. We were doing it from early intervention from preschool and then IEPs for years. We didn't, my oldest was in third. So I did it for many years. And I feel like something that they don't always tell you things. And I don't know if it's purposeful. I don't think it's purposeful. I think there's things that they really just don't know to tell you. And one of those things for us was, well, my son qualified for OT at school and was getting this little minimal occupational therapy session. I didn't realize for a good, probably couple of years that we could get it through our insurance, that we could go to the local therapy place, the physical therapy place up the block. And he was entitled to sessions of OT through our insurance. So we were able to actually double down on his therapy services at that time. When we started de-schooling, like I said, I took everything off the table. We wound up moving and I have found what works for us and what's really, really been helpful for him. So I have not decided to throw that onto his back right now. And a lot of it is actually suggestions from OTs. I go on Pinterest and I'm looking at different things he plays. When we listen to audiobooks, we're huge into audiobooks. My daughter loves to play with slime. If he's not playing with Transformers, he's got therapy putty that I didn't even know existed, but a local occupational therapist suggested it to me somewhere along the line. And that's what he plays with when he's sitting there. So we do a lot 
copy work and speech to text. We have our own accommodations. But I do believe we live in North Carolina now. I do believe that in North Carolina, you can have your children tested through the public school. You can get an IEP for your child through the public school and you can bring your kids to therapies if they qualify. I'm about 90% sure that that is true (laughs) from what I gather. We just haven't jumped on that bandwagon because... Because you found what works for you, right? Yeah, we found what works for us. We started using All About Reading instead of paying a million dollars for Orton Gillingham tutors. And I cannot describe to you how much better that has worked out for my son, where I don't feel... Like he needs that. He's doing so well with what we're doing. So yeah, we that's where we're at personally. But I do believe that there are services out there for those who would want or need them because it's a great resource to tap into yeah. for sure. Now, on top of everything, you recently <laughs> decided to start a podcast also called So You Think You Want to Homeschool. So who did you design your podcast for? I designed it for me. (laughs) I designed it for either new or unexpected homeschoolers. So whether that means that you're, you never intended to go to public school, but you're just starting out, your kids are just old enough that you're starting to research it. Or, you know, I just, I never expected that this was going to be where we ended up. I really did not. Even when I started looking into it, I had like zero confidence in myself If the pandemic hadn't happened, I don't think that I ever would have taken the leap because I didn't have the confidence in myself to do it. And I think that that is probably what like my biggest goal is with the podcast is to answer the questions and kind of just like tell a few anecdotal stories of this is how we got here. This is how easy it is. Not that it's easy. (laughs) It's easier than you think it is. It's easier than you think and you can do it, especially when you're stuck in that hamster wheel of public school and maybe IEP meetings and maybe feeling like you're doing the best, you're doing the best. Every hoop that we jumped through, every therapy, every accommodation always felt like we're getting closer, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. Meanwhile, now I have them home and I can do all of the accommodations. I don't have to jump through hoops to do it. We just do it now. So it's not as hard as it looks. It's not as overwhelming as it looks. It does take effort. There are good days and bad days, of course. I think that's my biggest goal with the podcast. So if you're an unexpected homeschooler for whatever reason, or just new to homeschooling, I just want to put people at ease. (laughs) And we'll be linking to that in the show notes. Now, Yeah. for new listeners... Is there an episode that you're like, you know what? I want you to listen to this one first. Oh, that's hard. I mean, I guess that like progressionally, the best idea would be to listen to the like get to know me episode. Just like, you know, get to know your host so that you can decide if I'm your cup of tea because I'm sure I'm not everybody's, but you'll kind of get a feeling for if I resonate with you. There are so many different styles of homeschooling. So I guess that would be a great place to start. But I also do want to shout out My most recent episode is our entire reading journey, starting in the public school system and then where we landed. And it was like an emotional one for me to record, honestly. I didn't realize until I started doing it and started really like realizing what all we went through when you're trying to get, you know, tell a story from point A to point Z, you know, or wherever we're at now. But I find that one I feel like is my favorite one because it gives information to people who maybe don't have it. Because I didn't have it. And it's a big one. Reading is such a stress. Oh, it's such a stress. If you have a struggling or delayed reader, it's why does that feel like such a failure? But it's such a big responsibility for us as parents yes. and as homeschool parents. So yes. I feel like yes, that's you a nailed great that. One. Homeschool parents in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with standards being where they are in school, which I mean, hot topic, but I do feel like school standards have just, I mean, from when I was in kindergarten to what kindergartners are expected to do now in the school system is like such a huge giant leap. Yeah. So when you're comparing yourself against that, it's very difficult, but it doesn't have to be. And I really enjoy that episode. (laughs) So there's two. Now you went over, you know, what made you decide to start the podcast? Now, how do you get it done on top of everything? Oh, 
as I've mentioned, schedules are not my biggest forte. (laughs) So how I get it done is I don't hold myself incredibly accountable. I have not ever said that it will be airing every week at this time. And this, you know, it's very recreational for me. I don't have a huge following, so I don't feel hugely responsible, but I do try to get the information out. I am shooting for like a once a week situation and I lock myself in the car. I allow myself grace. So nobody can see the right now of how I'm talking to Erica, (laughs) who is in the dark and in her car. So I just want to put that out there because so many people think that they can't do something because they don't have the perfect setup. Oh, my goodness. The perfect clothes. They don't have the perfect anything. So Erica is in her car in the dark and (laughs) I look like I'm at a desk. But behind me is just way too many Legos. And I just don't even know what's on the floor behind me in the center of my house. So I wanted to bring that up because so often people have those dreams, whether it's writing or doing a podcast of their own, doing a blog. And, you know, it's important to know that it it doesn't have to look a certain way. Oh, well, that's why I love podcasting. Podcasting is wonderful. It's not like TikTok. You don't have to do your makeup. You don't have to. (laughs) Wait, I'm supposed to be doing my makeup for TikTok. I was going to say not like. There's filters, everyone. There's filters. It's so true. But I started my first episode. We were in Florida. I was in the closet of our hotel room my first episode. (laughs) Absolutely. You just do what you got to do. This is really what started it. I found that I was getting questions from people and a lot of the same questions where it was like, I could either just like write a novel and copy and paste it every time someone, or I could say, just go check out my podcast. That's episode two. It was almost just categorizing the thoughts and questions that I tend to get from people who reach out to me because so many people knew me. I was a PTA mom. I was very involved. I was a Girl Scout troop leader, was there all the time. My youngest was always in trouble. I felt like I lived at that school, whether he stuck his foot in the toilet bowl and needed a new pair of shoes (laughs) or we were doing a book fair or whatever. I lived there. So people knew me and now people see me doing this and I'm someone that they'll say, "Uh you know, especially politically, everything is going crazy. A lot of my friends are from New York and nobody knows there's all this uncertainty and people I feel like are starting to think about it more than they ever have. I do get like a lot of these same questions about just getting started. Where do you start? How do you do this? What, what curriculum do you use? How do you go about it? It it is is scary at first. I do remember the very first day that nobody came knocking on my door. You might (laughs) demand that my oldest be in kindergarten. And I was like, why isn't anyone here? I really expected everyone that people were going to show up on my door. Right. And I was going to have to like stand tall and be like, well, I'm homeschooling. And nobody came. Then I was really surprised. I was like, yes, apparently... I'm doing this. It's kind of like when they let you out of a hospital with the baby and no instruction manual. And you're like, really? I can go home? You just let me go? (laughs) You're just going to let me go out into the universe with this kid? What? Are you crazy? I've never done this before. (laughs) That's that's a great analogy. That is definitely Uh, a great analogy. And there's no one to check. There's no one to check. This is my favorite part. We use Blossom and Root. And I remember that first year we were using it and we didn't finish we wound up, we didn't finish oh, no. by the end of the year. I know, right? <laughs> what What could you, you possibly imagine anything more stressful than that when I know my kids want a summer vacation and we didn't finish? Well, guess what? We finished it in September and October of the following year. We just <laughs> paused it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is phenomenal because nobody knocked on my door and said, hey, <laughs> you, know, you didn't finish that book. That was probably one of the most freeing moments for me when we picked up the same level as the previous year and just kept on moving the next year. And I was like, oh, it turns out I'm in charge. Isn't that shocking? Yeah. I'm in charge here. So we get to do it how I say. Yeah. And I recommend that, by the way, staggering your curriculum like that, because the first year I spent a boatload of money just on buying everything for September, getting it all ready. You have to buy everything. Yes. <laughs> oh, especially in the beginning. But then now it's like we're some stuff we buy in the beginning of the year, but we're not going to be done with this curriculum until it staggers it. Yes. I'm still spending, you know, money on things. It's just more spread out. <laughs> so I'm yeah. an advocate of not finishing on time because it works <laughs> out. So one of the things I love to do 
is to do a little bit of rapid fire at the very, very yes. end. And I changed I'm, the I'm questions nervous. out. Sometimes some of them are the same. Sometimes they're not. I don't want I feel like I'm on Andy Cohen here. playing one of his like late night games <laughs> like I'm going to be. But I'm excited. I'm excited. Okay. Are you ready? I think so. Okay. Favorite field trip you've ever taken? Ooh, that's a good one. My favorite field trip that we've ever taken, I think, was actually when we went to the local science center for my youngest son's birthday. That was his birthday. We we tried to do an outside the house experience on birthdays. And we went to the local science center and it just so happened to line up that their temporary displays were everything we had been doing in science that year. Oh it was goodness. all, and I was like, oh my goodness, I couldn't have picked it if I tried. I didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> we just looked like the most impressive little bunch because they were like talking knowledgeably about all of these things because we just finished doing all of this for science. So I was like, wow, this is a real like, you know, brush your shoulders off moment. Look at yep. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Favorite pick me up for a hard homeschool day. Um, hot chocolate. Ice cream, hot chocolate. Hot, so, ice cream, froyo, or none at all. Ooh, um, ice cream sandwiches. We love ice cream sandwiches. Ooh, like that. Early bird mm-hmm. or night owl. Um, night owl. Favorite outdoor activity. Um, hiking. Not my kids' favorite, but my favorite. I try to go by myself if I can, my but they don't always let me. <laughs> favorite snack your kids eat out of the house out of the house. Uh, you know what their favorite snack is? Anything that another homeschool mom packs in their bag <laughs> for th- for the event of the day. Okay, that that's that's the best answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing in your house, but anything they nothing. have. Nothing. Anytime somebody takes their little snack things out and says, "Oh yeah, you can have some." That's their favorite snack ever. <laughs> anything we didn't bring with us, but somebody else did. How do you take your coffee? Um, I take my coffee with a little sugar and, um, a little bit of milk, but I am more of a tea person lately because I'm an old lady apparently. And this crazy thing happens when you get old, where if I drink too much coffee, it's like my heart and my bladder have a battle to see which one's going to explode first. I'm either going to pee in my pants or my heart is going to explode. So we, (laughs) it's fun getting old. Oh my goodness. Favorite kid movie. Oh, that is almost impossible. But I will say that I loved Strange World that just came out. Yes, I love that too. I wouldn't say it was my favorite of all time, but it's popping into my head rapid fire style because okay. I wasn't I wasn't particularly excited about it. And then we watched it and I would watch it 15 more times just to get every little pick up on something new every time. That was such a great, well done, well done film. Well, there's only two more. Are you ready? Favorite I'm ready. bug. Favorite bug? Ooh. I mean, is it too cliche to say butterfly? No, I don't think so. (laughs) And here's the last one. This is really important. How do you feel about glitter? I love glitter, but only for special occasions because A, it's ridiculous to clean up and B, I think it just adds excitement. I use glitter when like the leprechaun comes to visit or for elf activities. I use glitter for things that really need to be made special. So we don't overdo it. I keep it special. <laughs> I love that. So Erica, where can our listeners find you other than your podcast that so you think you want to homeschool? I know that's on Apple, Spotify, and Anchor. Yes. Um, so really the only other thing that I'm currently on is TikTok. And as embarrassing, like my dirty little secret, my handle is housewives underscore n <laughs> underscore homeschool because the two things that i talk about are housewives Bravo and, TV homeschool. <laughs> and homeschooling sometimes and we'll my link to, makes uh, an appearance <laughs> we'll link and provide all of the information in the show notes for everyone listening i cannot thank you enough for being here you just dropping nuggets of wisdom all over this episode. (laughs) So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been wonderful. I'm so excited. I can't explain how much we love your membership and my kids just adore you. And I'm going to say it on the air because as I said to you, they were more excited. I could have told my kids I was going to be on Jimmy Kimmel and they wouldn't have blinked, but I'm talking to Miss Julie tonight and I scored some serious cool mom points. (laughs) Oh my, okay. I will try not to turn red right now. It's so lucky this is audio only. So (laughs) that's why I love podcasting. (laughs) Okay, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this very special episode until next time.